This is the 17th in a series of videos that I'm creating to support a course that I'm teaching in elementary number theory. And here we're going to continue our discussion of primitive roots mod n. And in fact, we will classify all natural numbers for which there exist primitive roots. But before we get to those theorems and proofs, let's recall some definitions and other results. First, the order of a mod n is the least natural number m such that a to the m is congruent to 1 mod n. And here we use this notation, m is equal to the order mod n of a. That's how we read that. And I guess not built into this definition is the fact that the GCD of a with n needs to be 1. That's just to ensure that the order makes sense in the first place. Because if that GCD is not 1, then there is no exponent that you can raise a to to achieve 1 mod n. Okay, and then the next is like a really simple divisibility result, and that is that the order of a mod n always divides phi of n, where that's the euler totian function evaluated at n. And you can prove this pretty easily just using some sort of division algorithm argument and the minimality of the order. Okay, then next is the definition of a primitive root. So we say r is a primitive root mod n if the order mod n of r is phi of n. So this up here says that the largest possible order is phi of n, and this says that if we achieve that largest possible order, then we're special and we're called a primitive root. And then furthermore, the last thing we proved in the last video is that there is a primitive root mod p for every prime. And then we gave some examples of composites where there were not primitive roots, and we proved that there were not primitive roots, and then we looked at some other composites where there were primitive roots. So like I said, today we really want to classify all natural numbers that allow us to have primitive roots, starting with this first theorem, which says that there is always a primitive root mod a power of a prime. But let's read this a little bit more carefully. So let's say p is an odd prime and r is a primitive root mod p. So we've got a primitive root mod p by the theorem that we proved in the last video. Then there is an integer m such that r plus m mp, which we will set equal to g, is a primitive root mod p to the k, where that k can be any natural number. So that means out of a primitive root mod p, we can create a primitive root mod p to the k for any natural number k. Okay, so let's start with r is our primitive root mod p. And then that means by Fermat's little theorem, well actually that doesn't require us to have a primitive root, but we'll invoke Fermat's little theorem anyway, that r to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. But now we want to take that congruence and turn it into an equation because it's a little bit easier to work with equations. So that means r to the p minus 1 is equal to 1 plus px, and here x is some integer. Again, that's essentially just the definition of congruence mod p. So notice we're dividing both sides by p and keeping the remainder. Over here we get 1, but that's what we have from this congruence anyway. And now let's set g equal to r plus m p, where this m is to be determined. So we don't know what this m is yet, but after we see what sort of relationships that it must build, we can get an idea of what this m is. Okay, so now that we've got this g, I want to raise this g to the p minus 1 power and see what happens. So notice this is equal to r plus m p to the p minus 1. But then we can use the binomial expansion theorem in order to expand this out. So let's see what we get from that. So we're going to get r to the p minus 1 plus this sum as j goes from 1 up to p minus 1 of p minus 1 choose j, r to the p minus 1 minus j, and then m to the j, p to the j.
So while I did this expansion, I took the zeroth term out just because this is gonna play an important role given the fact that we have this identity up here and thus this equation right here. Okay, so now what I wanna do is put the fact that r to the p minus one is one plus px into this equation. So we have this is equal to one plus px plus the rest of this stuff. So I'll take out the j equals one term because that's gonna be useful to work with and then I'll keep the j equals two up to p minus one term inside of that sum. So the j equals one term is a factor of p because we have p to the one and then we'll have p minus one choose one so that'll just be p minus one and then we'll have m and then r to the p minus two. So it'll be m to the j, but j is one there. And then next we'll have this sum as j goes from two up to p minus one of p minus one choose j, r to the p minus one minus j, m to the j, p to the j. Okay, so just to reiterate, I first took out the zeroth term because it had the form of this guy up here. Now I took out the first term because it is also a multiple of p. And then I wanna notice that all of the rest of the terms are in fact multiples of p squared. So let's write that down. So this is a multiple of p squared. So now we can start putting this stuff together. So we've got this is equal to one plus p times x plus p minus one times m times r to the p minus two. So that's kind of a mouthful, but it's gonna be useful to keep that like as is. And then plus p squared times something. So I'll just put an orange box for that something because it actually doesn't matter what that orange box is. And now we can choose our number m. So let's pick our m, and actually we can pick m just from the set zero to one. I'll let you guys think about that, but it must make the following condition satisfied, that the GCD of p with x plus p minus one m r to the p minus two is equal to one. So let's talk our way through that. So notice if the GCD of X with P is equal to one, then we can just let M equal X. But if the GCD of X with P is not one, well, that means it would be P. That means if we let M equal one, we're adding a non-multiple of P to a multiple of P, but adding a non-multiple of P to a multiple of P means that we create something with the GCD of one. So either way we've got it, the GCD between P and this object right here, which is this coefficient, which I'll box like this, is one. And that's an important fact which we'll use for the next step. Okay, so let's bring the pertinent information up and then we'll move on. Okay, on the last board we took all the parts of our hypothesis and we generated some conditions. So we had R, which is a primitive root mod P, and then G was equal to R plus M P. And then let's recall that this M was chosen from the set zero to one, so that the GCD of these two things, which I've overlined in green, is equal to one. So I'll just put GCD of these two things is equal to one. So that was an important part of the process. And then after that, we have a leftover term, which is p squared times a bunch of stuff. We actually don't care what that bunch of stuff is. Okay, so now that we've got it like that, I'm gonna collapse all of this into one plus p times z while we keep this bit in mind. Okay, great. So now our next goal is to find the order mod p to the k of g. So notice we want that to be equal to phi of p to the k. So maybe let's write that down. So we want this to equal phi of p to the k, but we know that that's equal to p to the k minus p to the k minus one from some stuff that we did in a previous video. Okay, so let's introduce some notation just so this is easier to work with. So I'm gonna set d equal to this order. 
And immediately from this fact over here that we proved earlier, we know that d divides phi of p to the k, which I can write as p to the k minus 1 times p minus 1. But now let's also notice if we look at g mod p instead of mod p to the k, we see that it is indeed a primitive root. So let's write that down. So this is a primitive root mod p. Well, you might be like a little bit worried about that, but let's notice that by our definition of g, g is congruent to r mod p. Look at our definition, but r was assumed to be a primitive root. But that means when we're working mod p, the order of g must be p minus 1. Now extrapolating that up to this order, which I have d, which is modulo p to the k, that means d must be a multiple of p minus 1. In other words, we have p minus 1 must divide d. Okay, but now let's put these two facts together. So we've got d divides p to the k minus 1 times p minus 1, and then p minus 1 divides d. So that tells us that d, in fact, must be a multiple of p minus 1, because we've got this divisibility relationship on both sides with p minus 1. So d has got to be a multiple of p minus 1. But then on the other hand, the only other parts that could make it up would be powers of the prime. So we've got d is equal to p to the, I'll call it l, times p minus 1. So that's what those two purple boxes tell us. And of course, to finish this off, we want to show that this l is in fact equal to k minus 1, which means g is our primitive root mod p to the k. So that's what we're trying to get. Okay, so let's see how we can get there. So let's take this object right here, which is g to the p minus 1, and let's raise it to the pth power to see what happens. So notice that's the same thing as 1 plus pz to the pth power by the way that we collapsed all of those parts into that z object. But now by binomial expansion, that's equal to 1 plus p squared times, I'll call it z1, where I just like collapse everything else into that z1. And now we're going to keep going. So furthermore, if we've got g to the p minus 1 to the p squared, that's going to be the same thing as 1 plus p squared z1 to the pth power, where I just did this sort of substitution in there and then used exponent rules. But that's going to give us 1 plus p cubed times z3. So now I think you can see where we're going. Notice that the pth power of our g to the p minus 1 was 1 plus p squared z. Our p squared power of g to the p minus 1 will be 1 plus p cubed times z3. And so similarly, if we go down to g to the p minus 1 to the p to the l power, which is this power right here, we'll see that this is equal to 1 plus p to the l plus 1 times z sub l. But now we want to use this fact right here to notice that that tells us that the GCD of P with all of these ZIs is equal to 1. But now also we see that this is just a fancy way of writing G to the D. And D is the order of G mod P to the K, which means all of this is congruent to 1 mod P to the K then these z's are not contributing anything to the powers of p here, which tells us that this l plus 1 must be really bigger than or equal to k. But by the fact that we have this divisibility condition, we, mean, we know that it has to be less than or equal to k. So in the end, we see that l plus 1 is equal to k. But if l plus 1 is equal to k, that means l is equal to k minus 1. But now if L is equal to K minus 1, that means we can replace this L with K minus 1. And we see that that is exactly phi of P to the K. So we've got the order 
of our element g mod p to the k is phi of p to the k, but that's exactly what we need in order for this to be a primitive root mod p to the k. Okay, so now let's get rid of this and then we'll prove like a nice corollary of this theorem. Now we're ready to finish off our classification of the natural numbers that admit primitive roots. And that goes with this following theorem of which we've proved some of the cases already. So we will show that there is a primitive root mod n if and only if n is equal to one, two, four, p to the k or two times p to the k for some odd prime p. Now before we get started, I wanna point out that our last theorem took care of this case. In other words, we know that p to the k admits a primitive root. And then by some simple examples, we can see that one, two, and four also admit primitive roots. So that means all that's left to do is show that we can have a primitive root mod two times p to the k, and that it's impossible to have a primitive root mod anything else. So let's get started with this reverse direction first. In other words, show that two times p to the k admits a primitive root. Again, because this blue box stuff we have already done. Okay, so headed into the reverse direction, we want to suppose that we already have a primitive root mod p to the k. So let's suppose that r is a primitive root mod p to the k. And in fact, a primitive root mod p to the k will be really related to the primitive root mod two times p to the k. And so that's what we we'll want to do. Build a primitive root mod two times p to the k out of this primitive root. And we can do that with the following assignment. So let's let g equal to r if r is odd. Okay. And then we'll set it equal to r plus p to the k if r is even. And let's notice that any way you hack it here, we see that g is a primitive root mod p to the k. So it is here because we're letting it equal the primitive root that we started with, and it is here because we're adding zero mod p to the k, so there's really nothing to do. So now we wanna look at the order of g mod two times p to the k. So let's maybe set d equal to that order. So like I said, the order mod two times p to the k of g. And what we want this to be equal to, so I'll just put that in green, we want this to be equal to phi times two p to the k. But let's notice that that's the same thing as phi of p to the k. That's pretty easy to see just from our formula for the Euler totient function. I'll let you guys think about that. Okay, so now let's jump into the rest of the proof. This means that g to the d is congruent to one mod two times p to the k. But now we can split that, to, that congruence into two congruences. We know that g to the d is congruent to one mod two, and g to the d is congruent to one mod p to the k. But now this bit is kind of obvious because we constructed g to be odd. But then this bit right here tells us that phi of p to the k divides the order of g mod p to the k. Notice I said mod p to the k, not mod two times p to the k. But we know that order is equal to d. But then on the other hand, D must divide phi of two times P to the K. But then again, phi of P to the K and phi of two times P to the K are exactly the same. So that means we've really got two numbers that are dividing each other, which means they are the same. So we've got D is equal to phi of two times P to the K, which makes this g, a primitive root mod two times p to the k. So that finishes the reverse direction of this proof. So let's get rid of this and then we'll look at the forward direction. We just finished proving the reverse direction of this proof. Now we're ready to prove the forward direction. We'll actually do this by contrapositive. So we will take numbers not on this list, 
and then prove that they do not admit primitive roots mod n. Okay, so let's start with powers of two. So like I said, let's start with n equals two to the m for m bigger than or equal to three. Because notice we do have primitive roots mod one, two, and four, which are all powers of two. Okay, so we'll prove this by induction and our base case will be the case when m equals three. It's pretty easy to show that there's no primitive root mod eight, and that's because we only have a few numbers to check. So let's notice that the order mod eight of three is equal to two. Well, that's because three squared is equal to nine, which is congruent to one mod eight. The order of eight of mod eight of five is also equal to two. And furthermore, the order mod eight of seven is also equal to two. That's because when you square each of those numbers, you get one more than a multiple of eight. But let's recall that phi of eight is the same thing as eight minus four, which is four. So we've got a situation where nothing achieves this maximum order, which means there is no primitive root mod eight. And now we'll proceed by induction. So let's make an induction hypothesis. So let's suppose for some k bigger than or equal to three, there is no primitive root mod two to the k. And then we wanna show that this implies there's no primitive root mod two to the k plus one. So let's first notice that this implies that for all odd a in the integers, we have a to the phi of two to the k divided by two is congruent to one mod two to the k. So how do we know that? Well, that's because phi of two to the k is a power of two. And if this did not hold, then there would exist something where this is not equal to one, but that would have to be a primitive root. But now let's calculate that number, that phi of two to the k divided by two. And notice that that is two to the k minus two to the k minus one over two, which we can easily see is equal to two to the k minus two. So that difference of those things in the numerator is two to the k minus one divided by two, you get two to the k minus two. So putting that together with what we have, we see that a to the two to the k minus two is congruent to one mod two to the k. But that congruence tells us that we can take a to the two to the k minus two and write it as one plus x times two to the k. And then from here, we'll wanna square this equation. So let's see what we get if we square this equation. So over on the left-hand side, we will get a two to the k minus one. That's a little bit tricky to see because of what's happening in the exponents, but it's actually a good exercise to unravel why if you square this, you get this. So I'll let you guys do that. Now, if we square this term right here, well, we just multiply it out like a binomial. And what we'll see is we get one plus x times two to the k plus one, and then plus x squared times two to the two k. Okay, nice. But now notice if we reduce this, mod two to the k plus one, we'll get one. So notice this is congruent to one mod two to the k plus one. But now, since we chose a to be any odd integer, this congruence shows us that no a achieves the correct order mod two to the k plus one to be a primitive root. In other words, there are no primitive roots mod two to the k plus one, which finishes this first bit by induction. Okay, so now that we've got this taken care of, let's look at more general composite numbers. Okay, now that we've taken care of powers of two, let's take care of all other composites. So let's suppose that n is equal to m1 times m2, and here m1 and m2 are both bigger than two, and they are relatively prime. So the GCD of m1 with m2 is equal to one. 
So notice this is general enough to take care of all the other cases. Okay, great. So now I want to notice that one half times phi of n is the same thing as one half times phi of m1 times phi of m2, which we can write two different ways. We can write that as phi of m1 over 2 times phi of m2, or we could write that as phi of m1 times phi of m2 over 2. And you might be a little worried here that we're jumping outside of natural numbers because we're dividing by 2. But let's recall that phi of n is always even unless n is equal to 1. So notice it's impossible for n to be equal to 1 given these constraints on n and m1 and m2. So that's good to know. Okay, so now what we want to do is look at a to the 1 half phi of n and reduce it both mod m1 and mod m2. So let's notice that this is going to be congruent to a to the phi of m2 over 2 all to the power of phi of m1, which is congruent to 1 mod m1. That's by Euler's generalization of Fermat's theorem. And then furthermore, this is going to be congruent to a to the phi of m2 1 over 2, all to the power of phi of m2, which is congruent to 1 mod m2. Again, using Euler's theorem, just like on the other index instead of this one. Okay, but now if this object right here is congruent to 1 mod m1 and 1 mod m2, and m1 and m2 are relatively prime, that tells us that this object right here, a to the phi of n over 2, is congruent to 1 mod their product, which is n. But that tells us that it is impossible to achieve the order required to be called a primitive root. So in other words, there's no primitive root mod n in this setup. So that finishes the proof of this theorem. And like I said before, this is a really important classification theorem. So whenever you think back, do I have a primitive root mod n? Is n on this list? Then if it is, you do have a primitive root. If it is not, then you don't have a primitive root. This actually has a nice application to group theory. So if you've taken an abstract algebra class, this will answer the question also when the group of units modulo n is a cyclic group. So I'll let you guys think about that. I think I made a video on that a while ago. I'll let you guys find that if you want to. Okay, now that we've taken care of this, let's move on to a testing theorem for finding primitive roots. Now we're going to look at a test to determine if you have a primitive root mod p then once you've got that primitive root mod p, you can use the construction from the proof of the last theorem in order to create a primitive root mod p to the k, and then use that to create a primitive root mod 2 times p to the k as needed, although there's quite a bit of work involved in this. Okay, so let's see what our test is. r is a primitive root mod p if and only if r to the power of p minus 1 over q is not congruent to 1 mod p for all primes q that divide p minus 1. So this actually reduces the workload quite a bit for finding a primitive root mod p. Okay, so let's look at the forward direction of this proof and notice that there's really not much to do. So this just follows from the definition of primitive roots. So clearly, if r is a primitive root, then the smallest number that you can raise r to that exponent and get 1 will be p minus 1. But all of these are smaller than p minus 1, so it's impossible to get 1 out of those. Okay, so now let's look at the reverse direction. And let's suppose that r is not a primitive root. So we're working by contrapositive. And that means we want to find a prime that will make this kind of object congruent to 1 mod p.
Okay, so this tells us that r to the d is congruent to one mod p for some d which is less than p minus one, but we know that d must also divide p minus one by this kind of thing that we did over here. Okay, so the fact that d divides p minus one and d is not equal to p minus one, tells us that we can write p minus one as d times k, where k is not equal to one. I guess I should have been more specific here. We know that d is less than p minus one. Okay. In other words, it's the order of r. So now the fact that k is not prime means that k has a prime factor. So let's say that k is equal to q times x for some integer x, and q is prime. Okay, so now from here, we can write p minus one over q as d times x. That's what's left over after we substitute this q times x in for k. But now we're pretty much good to go. Notice if we take r to the p minus one over q, that's the same thing as r to the d to the power of x. But our assumption was that r to the d was congruent to one, so that means this is all congruent to one mod p. So again, that proves this, proves this reverse direction using the contrapositive. Okay, so now let's do an example. Okay, so as an example of our testing strategy from the last theorem, or maybe test, let's find a primitive root mod 29, and let's do it as quickly as possible. So that means we don't need to find all of the exponents up to 28. We only need to look at something regarding the primes that divide 28, which is obviously 29 minus one. So the primes that divide 28 are two and seven. Okay, so that means we only need to check two different things to see if they are congruent to one mod p or not. And that is two to the 28 over seven and two to the 28 over two. So if neither of these are congruent to one mod 29, then we know that two is a primitive root. Okay, so let's get to it. So notice that this is the same thing as two to the four mod 29. Well, actually it's just two to the four because 28 divided by seven is four. But notice two to the four is 16, but 16 is not congruent to one mod 29. Okay, so now we can start looking at this one. Notice that this is the same thing as two to the 14 which is maybe a little bit hard to work with, but we can use some modular arithmetic tricks. So notice that that is equal to two to the five times two to the five times two to the four, just by like standard obvious arithmetic. But now two to the five is 32, but 32 is congruent to three mod 29. So this is congruent to three times three times 16 mod 29, where we just did that reduction kind of as needed. But now we can start simplifying a little bit. So notice three times three is nine, but then 16 is minus 13 mod 29. That makes that slightly easier because 13 is smaller than 16. That becomes minus 117 mod 29. But then you can easily check that 117 is not a multiple of 29. But then from there, you can reduce this and see that this is minus 30, which is minus one mod 29. So the important thing is that it is not one mod 29, it's minus one mod 29. So these two facts together tell us that two is a primitive root. Okay, so let's get rid of this and we'll leave you with some warm-up exercises. Okay, so I'll leave you guys with some warm-up exercises. The first is to determine which from this list of numbers has a primitive root. And then the second is to find a primitive root mod three squared, five squared, and 18. Okay, that's a good place to stop.